Hi there, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. In this video we're going to be taking a look at DDR5 RAM. There's been a lot said about DDR5 with the release of Alder Lake. These CPUs, the 12th generation from Intel, are kind of unique in that they can run either DDR4 or DDR5 RAM. Your choice of motherboard will dictate which kind of RAM you need for your build. So it's worth then looking at the implications of choosing one over the other. Which one performs better? Most people are saying at the moment that DDR5 isn't worth the money, but we wanted to check that for ourselves and for you so that we could give you the best possible advice. In order to do this, we've got hold of one of the fastest commonly available RAM kits at the moment, the G-Skill DDR5 6000 MHz kit, which is at CL36 and uses Samsung integrated circuits. This is a kit that retails at $400, and we wanted to find out if there was any possible way that price was justified. Does it outperform DDR4 kits, even manually tweaked and high-performance DDR4? Or are there any other reasons you might want to choose this RAM over the currently available DDR4? We've conducted our testing using the i7-12700K, which was provided by Intel, and we've also used two motherboards for this testing. We've got the MSI Z690 Tomahawk DDR4, which we used for all our DDR4 testing. The DDR5 testing was performed on the MSI Z690 Carbon, again provided by Intel. All of the testing was conducted with the CPU at stock settings to ensure that any of the performance differences we saw were due to the RAM and not any other settings or overclock settings with the motherboards we used. To test the DDR5 RAM, we ran it at two settings. First of all, we obviously tested the XMP profile on this RAM, which is 6000 MHz, CL 363636. We also ran it at default, which gives you the JDEC default timings of 4800 MHz CL40. Just to demonstrate that some of the slower RAM kits you can buy are around that specification, and we wanted to find out if there's a significant performance differential there if you did opt for cheaper DDR5 RAM. It runs at gear 2 in all of these settings. There should be a little bit of overclock headroom on this RAM as well. It will apparently run up to around 6400 MHz with relatively tight timings. However, it takes a long time to tune and verify RAM overclock settings, and it's something we didn't want to misrepresent by uh, presenting t settings that weren't optimal, or that perhaps were pushing things a little too far and weren't truly stable. Therefore, we've remained with the XMP profile of this until we've got a better handle on tuning DDR5 RAM. If we can get any more performance out of this kit, we'll make a video about it and show you what we've found. The DDR4 RAM that we tested consisted of G-Skill Ripjaws RAM, clocked at 3600MHz CL16, which we tested at XMP, and there's also some Crucial Ballistics 3200MHz CL16 RAM, which is a popular and cheap kit at the moment. We also tested our Samsung B-Die DDR4 kit, it's 4400MHz CL19 RAM, which we tested both at that XMP setting in Gear 2, and we also clocked it down, but with some tune timing settings to around 4000 MHz CL16, which runs in gear one on this Alder Lake CPU. So let's dig into our results and see what we can find out about DDR5 RAM performance on Intel's 12th generation of CPUs. We tested our RAM configurations on Cinebench, which is a popular CPU benchmarking tool which involves rendering out a scene. We're not going to dwell on these results too long, but it does just bring to your attention a couple of important points about testing RAM. This test is simply not responsive to RAM speed. In both Cinebench R20 and R23, there's enough noise that the order of these results is essentially meaningless. In Cinebench R20, the DDR5 RAM bookends the charts with XMP off and XMP on, and that's perhaps as much as you can deduce, that applying an XMP profile might help things a tiny amount. The spread of these results and their trend isn't indicative of any consistent scaling with RAM speed. There's just 100 points in it, which is too small to be sure of that it's not just run-to-run -run variance. In Cinebench R23, there's a 500-point spread of 2,300 points, and to put that into context, that's about the performance improvement you'd expect from turning a CPU cooler fan up to full speed. Again, DDR5 doesn't make any mark on the variety of DDR4 RAM options we've got under test here. We're wary of drawing any conclusions from these results, other than to say that Cinebench really isn't a reliable indicator of RAM performance. It doesn't seem to scale well with different specifications of RAM fitted, and there's no trend in results. Moving on, 3 d Mark's Time Spy CPU test is a little more encouraging. The results here do scale with DDR4 RAM speed, indicating that RAM speed is indeed a factor in performance. DDR5 acquits itself acceptably. It's in the middle of the pack at default JDEC settings, and comfortably in the lead at XMP beating our DDR4 Samsung B-Die, both at XMP and manually tuned, but far from optimal settings. So long as we ignore the price of the RAM kit, we can live with this performance in this test. To test a production workload, we ran the Blender benchmark, using the CPU to render out a couple of the scenes. You might think that this processor and memory intensive task would favour fast RAM, but the results across DDR4 and DDR5 show little evidence of this. This test relies entirely on CPU performance, and doesn't scale to an appreciable degree with RAM speed. It takes virtually the same time no matter what RAM you run. 
the 1% difference is margin of error. To simplify these results, we've just used the base JDEX speeds and the optimized XMP speeds to demonstrate how little difference there is between RAM speeds in this test. In short then, for Blender and production workloads similar to it, RAM speed really isn't that big a factor, and what you need, in fact, is a sufficient quantity of RAM, and that's what you should really focus on rather than tr trying to optimize RAM speeds. Unless, of course, you've got other tasks that you know are RAM speed sensitive. Moving on to games, we know that Shadow of the Tomb Raider does show reliable scaling with RAM speeds in DDR4 testing, and it's a very consistent benchmark as well, allowing us to pick apart the minute of the way a CPU performs as we alter some variables. Here we're showing the CPU game results from the inbuilt benchmark. This frees us from any influence of the GPU, allowing us to assess pure CPU performance in running the game engine. RAM speed clearly helps here with DDR4 RAM speeds scaling nearly linearly with total latency. As we can see, DDR5 essentially equals the tuned DDR4 Samsung BDI at 4000MHz CL16. Does this translate to its actual performance? In total average FPS results, we can see that the DDR5 at XMP settings post equal with the best performing DDR4 RAM, which is 4400MHz CL19 running at XMP. The default JDEC DDR5 settings lead to about a 10% performance drop, equaling the 3200MHz CL16 DDR4 R4 RAM at 197 FPS average. If you're interested in why the order of performance changes, the 4000 MHz DDR4 results are the manual tune, and an imperfect one at that. XMP sets a number of settings that haven't been optimised, leading to better overall performance when the entire benchmark is taken into account, and not just the game engine results. Anyway, in this test, DDR5 is holding its own against fast DDR4 RAM. Moving on, Forza Horizon 5 is another AAA title that's got a very detailed inbuilt benchmark that gives us some numbers that allow us to look into how the CPU is actually performing at a game engine level. Here again, we can see that DDR5 matches the fastest DDR4 specifications in game engine performance. It's up there at 375 FPS average, versus 382 FPS for the very fastest 4000 MHz CL16 RAM. Overall, when we look at the total average FPS, we can see that the DDR5 running at 6000 MHz XMP profile is matching some of the quickest DDR4 RAM that we've been able to test. Overall, this results in a solid showing, equaling the performance of DDR4 kits from 3600 MHz CL16 up to 4400 MHz CL19. The takeaway here is really more about how slow RAM can harm performance than fast RAM or DDR5 can help it, since an off-the-shelf 3600MHz CL16 kit at XMP keeps up with both manually tuned DDR4 and a fast DDR5 kit. Looking at a fast-paced shooter that is CPU-bound much of the time, Rainbow Six Siege shows a similar trend to that we've been seeing in the other games. Here, DDR5 at the 3600MHz XMP speeds matches faster DDR4 RAM, with 530fps average. The very fastest kit in this test is the XMP 3600MHz DDR4, likely due to sloppy tuning of the 4000MHz DDR4 kit in our manual overclock. Without XMP, the DDR5 kit languishes down with the 3200MHz DDR4 at 510fps average. Not a great showing, but again this is just indicative of overall performance scaling with RAM speed. And finally, for data from game testing, let's take a look at Microsoft Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. This title is notoriously resource hungry, although it has improved with optimizations made this year. Nevertheless, it is very CPU dependent, and CPU performance, as we know, can hinge on RAM speed. To test this, we run a three minute AI controlled flight over Manhattan at low altitude and log our results. This test shows clear scaling with RAM speed overall, and we can assess where DDR5 memory sits. The XMP enabled RAM is sat in the middle of our results, between the 3200MHz CL16 and 3600MHz CL16 DDR4 kits. The fastest RAM in this test is the manually tuned DDR4 Samsung BDI at 4000MHz and Titan timings around CL16. So DDR5 is distinctly average in this test, where the CPU needs to grab data with low latency in order to process the next frame and advance the game world. So what have we learned then from our testing of this DDR5 kit? This is one of the fastest kits you can currently buy, it's 6000MHz CL36 and it costs $400. It's nearly three times as much as a good 32GB kit of DDR4 RAM, and yet its performance in all the testing we've done is pretty mediocre, it's very hard to differentiate it from good DDR4. Why is this? Well, megahertz isn't the only metric that matters in deciding how fast RAM is. The timings are of critical importance, and you can see in these kits that the latency is very much higher. This kit has a latency of CL36, that's 36 clock cycles for an important memory function to be performed. 
And across the board, when you look at DDR5 RAM, you'll find those tightings are very much looser. In order to assess the total latency of RAM, you actually divide that latency number into the clock speed of the RAM, which gives you the overall latency in nanoseconds typically. This RAM is around 12 nanoseconds total latency, whereas a good DDR4 kit will be down around 8.5 to 9 nanoseconds. That's a big difference, that's 20 to 30% slower, and that's the reason why DDR5 has a little bit of a mountain to overcome, despite its high clock speed, in order to outperform DDR4 RAM. There are also some circumstances we haven't tested here, where DDR5 does show marked performance improvements over DDR4, and that's down to its much higher uh, bandwidth. Processes like compression and decompression and some video editing and rendering processes are actually accelerated by DDR5, sometimes by as much as 20%. So if you're doing specialist workloads, frequently compressing or decompressing files, or in some video editing processes, rendering out videos, you might want to look a little bit deeper into DDR5 because it could offer some specific benefits to your workflow. The performance isn't really the problem. Whilst this is one of the most expensive and high performance kits you can buy at the moment at 6000 MHz CL36, it does keep pace with high-end DDR4 RAM. We're seeing it perform roughly equally to 3600 MHz CL16 RAM or 4000 MHz CL16-ish manually tuned BDI, which isn't a bad showing, it does perform fine, and we're not noticing any massive performance detriment. The problem with DDR5 at the moment really comes just down to two factors. The first one is obviously price. You have to pay way over the odds to get one of these kits. This 32GB kit was $400 equivalent, which is just far too expensive. Looking around the market, you don't want to buy the slower RAM. It's clear that 4800 MHz RAM is going to be disappointing in terms of performance. So you do want to buy up at the higher end, and even the very cheapest kits are around $300 still and hard to find. You only have to compare that to the pricing for some really good um, DDR4 kits at the moment. You're looking at perhaps $80 to $100 for 16 gigabytes of really high performance RAM, and only $115 to $150 for 32 gigabytes of great RAM and you can see that you're paying at least twice as much to get DDR5 specification. The other problem really stems from the options motherboard manufacturers have given us for this generation. They were clearly keen to promote DDR5 as the next big thing, and so particularly on Z690 chipset motherboards, for example, you'll find that once you pass around $350 to $400, pretty much every motherboard is DDR5 only. There's very few high-end motherboards with DDR4 as an option. This basically forces you into a very high spend for RAM that doesn't offer any significant performance advantage. So if you buy, for example, the MSI Carbon, which is a $400 motherboard, it's got some nice features, I wouldn't say it's necessarily worth $400, but it's got nice features and you want to take advantage of them, then you're also committing yourself to another spend of $300 to $400 just to get acceptably fast RAM for that platform. But it's worse still when you get to the B660 chipset, which is a really good chipset to pair with, for example, an i5-12400. You can actually make quite a cost-effective platform despite the slightly expensive pricing on those B660 motherboards. But then we look at things like the ROG Strix range from ASUS, and they've chosen to make each of those boards DDR5 only, and I've not seen any DDR4 variants, variants for the B660 ROG Strix lineup, even including the ITX version, the B660i. Now that's a real shame because you were looking at getting a $170 to $200 i5 CPU, putting it on that B660 platform, and yeah, you want to spend a little bit extra, get a nice looking motherboard, the ROG Strix line, but then you're committed to spend another at least $300 on RAM just to get your PC up and running. That just makes no sense. You're looking at a $650 to $700 spend there just on those core three components. And if you look, you could get a i7-12700K, a more cost-effective DDR4 Z690 motherboard like, for example, the MSI A-Pro or the Gigabyte Gaming X, and put 32 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM high performance on there, and you'd come in under that same cost, even including a cooler that you'd want for that system, uh, and significantly higher performance platform with the i7 instead of the i5 CPU. So for the moment then, we can categorically say that DDR5 RAM isn't worth it. We're in the sort of heyday of DDR4 RAM. There's some really fast, really good quality kits available very affordably, and they pair really well with Alder Lake. You're not harming the performance of an Alder Lake CPU by opting for DDR4 RAM. In fact, on the contrary, you're probably enhancing it. You can get better RAM, you can spend the extra money on better additional components like SSDs or a better tier of graphics card, and that means you'll get a better PC as an end result. And it's just a real shame that it does lock you out of some of those um, slightly more feature-rich high-end motherboards because manufacturers have chosen to make those DDR5 only and thus make the whole platform very much more expensive for anybody who wants a slightly higher-end build. 
it's not all about headline speeds with DDR5 RAM. There's a number of its features of its specification that mean it will become a, a more useful standard as time progresses. It'll be available in much bigger sticks, possibly up to as large as 128 gigabytes per stick when it matures. And it also has a split memory channel configuration, which increases memory efficiency and makes it a more efficient memory protocol to use. As we see the market mature, we'll get kits with better speeds and better timings becoming available. And they will absolutely, as we get into 2023 with AMD's new CPUs also using DDR5, they will become the de facto standard and the right round to get for next year. There are reasons why DDR5 is an important specification for the future, but as of right now, DDR4 is absolutely the right choice if you're building a high performance Alder Lakes PC in 2022. I hope you found this video useful and informative. Please do check out premiumbuilds.com where we've got this kind of analysis and testing and loads of advice to get you the best parts for your next PC.